In this part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about the energy required for switching. And the goal here is to kind of figure out what is the minimum energy that is actually needed to switch to understand what, where we are and where we need to be. So let's ask kind of what is the energy cost of reading out your flash memory or sort of reading the resistance of a resistor. The minimum energy is going to be determined by the noise. And we need to overcome two types of noise, sort of the shot noise, which is the noise due to random arrival of electrons, and Johnson noise, which is the thermal noise. So to understand the energy cost, we need to first understand the two main noise mechanisms. So shot noise is due to the random arrival of electrons. So let's say we have some average current. If you now look at it as a function of time, this current is actually made up of random discrete pulses corresponding to the arrival of individual electrons. And so this is a random Poisson process. What that means is that if you ask what's the standard deviation in the current, that's proportional to just the square root of the number of electrons. And so then using that, we can then find what is sort of the standard deviation in the current. So we just say the number of electrons in a given amount of time will just be the current times the time divided by the charge. And so if you just plug this into, the, into here, and we say that our change in current is going to be sort of the Q times the standard deviation over delta T, plug this back in, we find that sort of the noise current or the variation in current is proportional to the square root of the charge times the current divided by delta T. And now I want to sort of get this per unit bandwidth or per unit frequency. And so I can just substitute that the frequency is 1 over the change in time. And now I'll come back to where this factor of 2 comes from in a minute. But what that gives us is sort of the standard deviation in the current squared is 2qi times delta f. And so this delta f is sort of your bandwidth. Or what that means is that in 1 hertz or 1 bit, our noise current is 2q times the current itself, our noise current squared. And so now, why did I use this delta f equals 1 over 2 delta t? So to understand that, consider a step function signal with a width of delta t. So here we have your signal coming in. And now let's look at what is it in frequency space. So if you take the Fourier transform and sort of look at that squared, we'll get essentially a sync function. And so now the way we define delta f is it's such that the area of this box is the same as sort of the overall area under here. And so then if you go through and calculate what frequency that corresponds to, it's 1 over 2 delta t. And so then here are sort of some additional useful r frequency relations that allow you to sort of convert back and forth between frequency and time. For instance, the 3 dB frequency, that's to say when does this or achieve one half of its value, is pi over 2 times that is equal to this. And now similarly, if you wanted to model your circuit as an RC circuit, you'd get 1 over 4 RC. And so then this will just be useful in a minute when we talk about Johnson noise. And then if you want to kind of look into the actual details of the derivation, we can find that here. The second type of noise that we have to consider about consider is thermal noise. And so in a typical if you have a single mode, you have a noise of kT over 2. And now if you consider you have a capacitor with some energy, the energy stored will be Cv squared over 2. And if we set these equal, we get a noise voltage of kT over C. So that tells us roughly kind of how much voltage are we going to get just to random thermal fluctuations in the capacitor. We can now convert this to a bandwidth by assuming that we have some sort of an RC circuit that's charging our capacitor. Say we charge our capacitor through some sort of a resistor. We can then say that our frequency is going to be 1 over 4 RC, plugging that in here we find that our noise voltage is 4 kTr delta F. And then we can convert that to current just using V equals IR. Or if you want to know your noise power, I squared R, we actually see that it's 4 kT per bit. So what that tells us is that for every bit of information, there's going to be 4 kT noise present. And so then that's the noise we need to overcome. And so now if you want to read the current through a resistor, we have to overcome both the shot noise and the Johnson noise. And so now if we're trying to use minimum energy and operate at low currents, this I will go towards zero. 
but we'll still have a Johnson noise. So that's going to be our minimum noise. And that's what's going to dominate at low currents. So that means that we have to put in at least 4 kT of energy just to overcome noise. But now you would say we need a large, a good signal to noise ratio because we don't want to have an error every now and then. So that means that we're going to need about 10 times as much, 40 kT per bit. So this is the minimum energy that we would want to, to use to just overcome noise and to operate a transistor. Unfortunately, we're orders of magnitude away from this. So now I'd like to give you an idea of kind of what does 40 kT per bit of information actually mean. That's equivalent to saying we need one electron volt per bit, or 0.16 attojoules per bit of information, or 0.16 nanowatts per gigabit per second. It's a very small amount of energy that's actually required to overcome noise. Unfortunately, we're nowhere near this. And so the question is, why is that? And what it comes down to is there's a voltage matching crisis at the nanoscale. What happens is we can ask, what's the noise voltage on a wire? And so we look at a KT over C noise, put in the capacitance of a typical wire, and we find that it comes out to around 10 millivolts. So that means the wire wants around 100 electrons at 10 millivolts, and that's just to fulfill our signal-to-noise energy requirement of 1 eV. But unfortunately, our transistors are still operating around 1 volt. And so since our power is CV squared, that means that we have a huge penalty, 1 volt over 10 millivolts, or 10 to the 4x penalty, because we're driving our wires at a volt when they only want 10 millivolts. And this is why our power consumption is so far off from the fundamental limits. So our goal now is to solve this problem. All right, so now here I just want to kind of mention why did I say the noise on a wire is 10 millivolts? And so the noise was, of course, the KT over C noise. So the question is, what's the capacitance of a wire? And we can estimate that just by considering, say, a simple coaxial wire. Its capacitance is just given here. 2 pi epsilon naught over the natural log of the ratio of the outer diameter to the inner diameter. And so the key to get an estimate is to realize that this natural log varies slowly with respect to the wire diameters. So if you take a reasonable ratio of, say, 500, this natural log is roughly 2 pi. And so then this and this cancels, and our capacitance is roughly epsilon naught times the length. And so now we have an estimate of the sort of a wire capacitance based on its length. And so what we see is that if you have very long wires, say a centimeter, then our capacitance is fairly high and our noise is tiny, in the microvolt range. But then we could consider the opposite limit. Let's say we have very short wires, 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers. Our noise is still only tens of millivolts. And so that's the key challenge. We want electronics that operate at very low voltage around this noise limit rather than at one volt. 